Hi, this is Dr. Jason Kahn uh, on behalf of Langley Endodontics. Uh, before we start our uh, second case uh, on cervical resorption, uh, we had some good uh, questions and feedback uh, based on our first cervical resorption case uh, that I just wanted to go over. Uh, the first was asking me to place a side-by-side uh, -side, uh, comparison of the case for the uh, pre-op and the post-op. Uh, and so here it is. And the question was saying that uh, on the pre-ops, it appeared that the cervical resorption was on the mesial aspect, uh, and you couldn't really see uh, the repair on the post-op. Um, as you can uh, appreciate, the repair is actually overlapped with the uh, obturation in, uh, in the post-op here. Uh, and uh, as we'll go to the CT in a second to, to review it, uh, the resorption uh, coming from the cervix on the lingual aspect, uh, you can see in the post-op that it's a distal angulated film, and so following the uh, same lingual opposite buckle or slob rule, uh, a distal shift uh, on the lingual will shift distally as well. The second question uh, is if a crown would still be recommended for this tooth. Um, with the concern being that uh, the preparation might be too thin around the cervical area uh, and lead to fracture. Uh, and while this is an excellent point, uh, and we could, we could certainly debate, and I'm sure if there's comments uh, to, to follow this, uh, we could debate both sides uh, many times over, I think that the risk uh, is still greater uh, without a crown than with one. Uh, we'll switch to the CT just to, to refresh ourselves into where the location of this resorption defect was. Um, and it's, having a look here, we'll see that it's still in the crest of bone where it actually perforates right there. And so our crown margin is going to be above this point. I would also like to think that uh, as long as the crown margin doesn't end on the repair material itself, that uh, the two structures circumferential to uh, the area of perforation would be supportive of the crown. Uh, obviously this, this opinion would change uh, with the size of the perforation and the location of the perforation of, uh, of cervical resorption, uh, which going back to the CT scan uh, is uh, of paramount importance when we're doing our uh, treatment planning and uh, predicting the prognosis. Uh, second case that uh, I wanted to present today uh, is a 33-year-old uh, female with a non-contributory medical history. Uh, and her chief complaint was that uh, her, uh, her mesial uh, aspect of her uh, composite, her 4-7, uh, broke or fell out. Uh, and so she was in for, uh, for a simple change. It was an MO restoration. Um, you can see this radiograph was taken uh, after the uh, occlusal aspect of this was removed as well. And in removing the composite, uh, GP noticed a pulpal exposure, uh, or what they thought was a pulpal exposure. Um, and it was very shallow. It may be a little hard to tell uh, from the, uh, the upper right-hand picture here, um, but this is, this is less than one and a half millimeters in depth. Um, removing the pulpal tissue uh, turned out to be quite difficult uh, and got to the point where it was quite chunky, and this was when the case was referred to me. So the radiographs on the left-hand side are the bite wing and periapical. And with a uh, hindsight, we can now see that there does appear to be some sort of a resorptive lesion on the distal, distal aspect of this tooth, uh, the extent of which is not, uh, not completely clear. So going to CT examination, again, starting with our transverse view, uh, we can see that's the interim restorative material. And because the access has already been made, it's a little difficult to discern exactly where lesion is. This patient was asymptomatic, so there's no apical pathology, uh, but noticing both on the distal and the lingual, uh, the resorptive lesion appears to be um, extending almost from the mesial aspect around to the distal on that lingual part. Taking a look at the sagittal view, we can see that the lesion does appear to be entering in right at the distal at the CEJ, and that appears to be the only area of of perforation. Unfortunately, upon probing, I was able to probe uh, into this lesion. 
right in that area. And you can see that there is a little bit of, uh, of crustal bone loss. Again, we don't always understand the etiology of these lesions, and this could have been uh, damage to the, uh, to the lamina dura, the PDL, in this area upon removal of the eights, uh, or it could be related to bruxism, or it, it could possibly be a gap uh, junction uh, between the, uh, the enamel and the cementum uh, that has allowed bone to come in contact. In either case, the diagnosis would be cervical resorption, uh, in this case with sulcular communication, um, and asymptomatic irreversible pulpitis. The treatment, uh, since endodontic therapy has already been initiated and, and really surgical uh, option in this case would be, uh, would be extremely difficult. Um, we'll go through with conventional endodontic therapy. Um, in terms of the materials that we're going to use, uh, I think repairing the perforation and the dentin defect, uh, we're going to need something a little bit more durable or uh, something with a little bit stronger compression strength uh, because of the amount of dentin uh, that's been lost and the uh, tooth that we're looking at in terms of being the second molar taking a little bit more occlusal load. And so here we can see our pre-op and post-op films. Uh, the resorptive defect has been removed and the perforation area has been repaired uh, with bioceramic. Uh, and the idea here would be to restore this tooth uh, coronal to the CEJ so that the margin of the crown does not uh, end on bioceramic. Um, given that uh, bioceramic is a good material to interface with both soft and hard tissue um, and it has a good compressive strength, uh, it makes it the ideal material for restoring this. Uh, particular case. If you have any questions about this case or any other, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you for watching.